not exactly a seminar, a seminar together with a discussion. Um, so let's start first with uh, discussing automorphic L functions. So we'll fix uh, an automorphic representation pi uh, of G. Um, so pi is some irreducible representation realized in the space of functions here with uh, Langlands parameter. Uh, I'm gonna keep in mind that maybe we're interested more in function fields today. So the Langlands parameter will be a map from the very group of K to the dual group of, of G and I'll denote this by phi or phi sub pi. And um, an automorphic uh, L function is uh, defined with the help of some uh, representation of the dual group. So you choose a finite dimensional representation of the dual group. And then um, um, you define the L function of pi and rho. Oh, by the way, let me say uh, from the beginning that uh, sometimes I will just suppress the, the point of evaluation of the L function. So there should be an S here, but for me the S will be coming from a grading. So there's gonna be a Z grading or an N grading uh, on, on, on the vector space. So this will be a graded representation. Uh, and given that the, the L function is the product over all uh, places of your field of uh, the trace of Frobenius, uh, geometric Frobenius acting on the exterior algebra of uh, V rho composed with phi. Um, what is uh, V rho co composed with phi? Uh, it's just the um, it's just the the veil group representation. So V rho composed with phi uh, is obtained uh, as the composition of uh, of these two arrows that we fixed before, together with a twisting according to uh, we twist the Frobenius at, at V by uh, Q to the minus QV to the minus I over two on the I-th graded space. Uh, now, if you're worried about taking square roots of Q, don't worry, there's in the setting that we're talking about, um, they will be avoided, but uh, let me not get into, into this. So this is the automorphic L function of pi, of the automorphic representation pi. Uh, this is the definition, if you want, attached to the uh, uh, finite dimensional representation row of the dual group. Uh, but uh, over function fields, as someone remarked last time, there's nothing mysterious about the automorphic L functions over function fields. Um, uh, so what happens over function fields if K is the uh, function field of, uh, of a smooth projective curve? Then um, uh, rho composed with the Langlands parameter of pi defines a local system. Uh, let's call it again um, v uh, rho of phi uh, on uh, over the curve, and then uh, you can express. Uh, the L function, oops. Okay, that's supposed to be a row. Uh, you can express it as uh, the trace of Robinius 
the global Frobenius now Q uh, acting on the symmetric algebra of the global cohomology of the absolute curve um, and this local system. Where uh, the cohomology is viewed as a uh, the cohomology is viewed as a super vector space. So that means that in degree one, the symmetric uh, algebra is really the exterior algebra. So basically, you get determinants of the various degrees of cohomology. Um, or, I mean, the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius and the various degrees of cohomology in the numerator or denominator. So this is what the L function is, uh, but uh, this is the spectral. The, uh, this is what the L function means. Uh, this is the L function on the spectral side. That means uh, we have given a description of it in terms of, of the Langlands parameter. Uh, phi sub pi. And the question is, uh, what is um, what is the meaning of the L function? What is the meaning of L pi rho on the automorphic side? without references to, to Langlands parameters. And this is a particularly important question in number theory where we actually don't have the uh, spectral parameterization. We're not even close to that. So it's important to be able to study these L functions uh, purely uh, automorphically. Uh, before I get uh, to answer this question, uh, let's reinterpret um, uh, let's stick a little bit to the spectral side uh, to reinterpret uh, L pi rho as follows. Basically, I'm going to just reinterpret this formula that you see up here. Um, so, um, So let's reinterpret it geometrically, assuming that we have um, nice moduli stacks for Langlands parameters, which uh, in the setting of number fields, for example, we do not. But let's um, um, uh, let's stick to the case of uh, function fields. And let uh, log denote the moduli of uh, G-check local systems uh, on the curve. Can ask, yes? Can I ask a very stupid question? Sure. In either of these formulas for an L function you've given, is there a complex variable? Is there an S, lowercase s? Yeah, so uh, this is what I said before that um, uh, I will consider the representation rho as a graded vector space. And I'm really talking about the value of the L function at the point S, which um, depends on this grading. So I'm twisting the Frobenius action according to this grading. I see, I see. So this is, this is secretly the, not secretly, this is the value of the L function at some point that is determined by the grading of the, this is a graded representation. Okay, so it's a, somehow the, the S is a red herring. It's, it's just. Sorry, can I also ask, um, are you assuming that pi is discrete or not? 
Oh, I'm assuming everything that you want to assume for uh, to, to make sense of this. Uh, okay. Everything will be very approximate. Okay, but um, I, but is it is it on purpose that you're talking about Langlands parameters and not Arthur parameters, or are you assuming? Well, especially the difference between Langlands and Arthur parameters, I will completely ignore today. So, for example, okay. if I ever talk about geometric Langlands program, uh, you. I will just say quasi coherent sheaves, and there will not be anything reminiscent of Arthur parameters. Okay, okay. so everything will be oversimplified. Um, okay, so let's reinterpret just uh, this formula of the L function in terms of uh, global cohomology. Let's take the moduli of G check local systems on the curve, on the absolute curve. And um, uh, let's consider the dual, uh, the dual uh, vector space of V. And um, uh, now I'm gonna um, introduce some derived stack. And don't pressure me on derived algebraic geometry. I would not know. Uh, the answer most likely, but uh, I've been told that in a good settings there is a derived stack which I will call V check V star fixed, living over um, the moduli of G check local systems, and it is the derived stack of uh, horizontal sections of a, a given local system. So this parameterizes. Uh, pairs uh, p comma sigma where p is a local system and sigma is a section of the corresponding uh, linear local system on uh, over the curve v star so uh, classically, I mean, uh, as a naive, uh, as a non-derived stack, what is a section of the local system? A section of the local system, uh, so naively, a section of the local system is really just an element of H0 uh, over the curve uh, of uh, this representation that I denoted before by this. But if you view it as a derived stack, you also have higher uh, H's. Um, and therefore, uh, sorry, I should put a dual here. And I'm sure I should introduce some Tate twists, but I will not bother. Uh, so, uh, what you see up here in the formula, the symmetric power of um, the symmetric algebra of the cohomology of V can be understood as, so symmetric power uh, of the cohomology of uh, V rho V is the fiber at P at the local system of, um, so P is P depending on phi, uh, the fiber of this local system uh, of the push forward, let's use a small p here for this map, the push forward uh, of the structure shift of this uh, derived scheme. And uh, here's a picture. Uh, so, in the Deram setting, apparently you can think of um, uh, the moduli of local systems uh, as, um, as maps, sections from the Deram factor of the curve to uh, be G check, so point mod G check. And 
Over it, we have this space that I denoted by V star fix, which is sections of uh, V star Moji check. And this is the map that I denote by P. And we take, uh, we consider the push forward of the uh, structure shift of uh, uh, this space. And uh, this is what corresponds to the L function of V sub rho phi in the sense that phi defines. Um, so you take trace of Robinius. Uh, of the of this shift at p at at, at the um, at the local system defined by this parameter, and this is the L function. Let me pause here to see if there are any questions. David, did I screw up very much with derived algebraic geometry? Looks good to me. Okay, okay. So uh, keep this picture in your mind. We're going to come back to this. Oops. We're going to see a similar picture on the automorphic side. So let's talk about the automorphic in incarnation of L functions, which is periods. Um, so various L functions. Uh, so, various L functions appear. L functions appear as uh, integrals of automorphic forms. Integrals of automorphic forms. The automorphic form is an element in pi, which, as we said, is an automorphic representation. Uh, but uh, throughout, for now, I will fix uh, level and ramified everywhere, ignoring Archimedean places if you're interested about number fields. So everything will be invariant under K, which is just the hyperspecial maximal compact subgroup at every place. So my automorphic uh, form uh, will be unramified just for simplicity. And that determines it uniquely up to a scalar. So what does it mean that L functions appear as integrals of automorphic forms? Let me share another screen that I have prepared. So in this uh, table, you will see various spaces, uh, sometimes homogeneous. Um, so you see in the first case, for example, uh, what appears is the so-called Whitaker space. It's the quotient of G by a unipotent maximal, uh, by a maximal unipotent subgroup, uh, which is endowed with a non-degenerate character with a character, an additive character in general position. So maybe I should write it here. So N is a maximal unipotent subgroup. And then you take a non-degenerate character to the additive group. And then at the level of adelic points, uh, you take an adel, you take a character, let's say to your coefficient field, let's say to C star. C, that's what C is. And this character should be trivial on, on OK. So it's an automorphic character. Um, so OK, so and, and as before, F belongs to my automorphic representation. So I consider the integral uh, of my automorphic form over the unipotent subgroup with this character, that's the Whittaker period. Uh, in other words, for classical modular forms, it is the Fourier coefficient. 
And uh, whenever possible, we will normalize this to be one. So we have a choice of automorphic form up to scalar and we will normalize it to be one in order to compare with every other uh, period that you will see. So the second example is the diagonal period. So here my group is two copies of a group and my subgroup is the diagonal copy. In other words, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the group under uh, the action of itself by left and right multiplication. And uh, my automorphic form now will have this form. And I'm integrating it over the diagonal. It turns out that if I normalize my automorphic form according to its Fourier coefficient, uh, then uh, it's a well-known formula in the GLM case. In general, it is uh, conjectural although there are important results uh, by Lapid and Mao and uh, other people in, for classical groups. So the, uh, if you normalize your automorphic form uh, by its Fourier coefficient, it turns out that its Peterson inner product uh, is equal to the value of the adjoint L function at one. So here this, what you see in the notation, if you're not familiar with this notation for L function, this is the row that I put before. And this one means that uh, my vector space is, uh, has grading two. So this, uh, the point of evaluation is half of the grading. So the grading of my vector space is two. Um, you can also consider the trivial period. The trivial period is, uh, basically when you integrate an automorphic form over the entire group. So this is meaningless unless uh, the form is constant, then I cannot normalize it exactly by its Fourier coefficient. So let's take the constant function here and then integrate it over the group. And I forgot to say that I'm using um, the measure that would be counting measure on, uh, on this space modulo uh, GO. And then uh, what you find is you find uh, uh, the L function of the so-called motive of G. The motive of G is a space which uh, you can identify with the maximal, uh, the Lie algebra of the maximal torus modulo the Weyl group with an appropriate Galois action that I'm not gonna get into now. But you see in every, in all of these examples, you get something like an L function appearing when you integrate automorphic forms. Uh, I didn't explain the, the second column. The second column is the, is the Gates-Corey and Nadler dual group of, of the period. Uh, what this means is uh, it tells you, it puts some restrictions on the, on the Langlands parameter. Uh, for example, in the group case, uh, you cannot have any kind of Langlands parameter into the product of H and itself. Uh, the in order for the inner product to be non-zero, uh, the representation has to be, uh, you have to take an automorphic form and it's complex co conjugate, or you have to take a, a representation on one copy of H and the dual representation on the other copy. So that puts some restrictions on the dual group. So instead of having the full dual group H times H, you only have the, uh, the dual group of H here. And similarly for the trivial period, um, the restriction is that it has to be the trivial representation. So the dual group is trivial for the trivial period. There's also an R4 parameter that comes in, but let me not go into that. Let's look at some more examples. Yes. A very naive question about this uh, H cross H case. Uh, yes. Can one try to understand it in the classical case? So you said that uh, this integral uh, of F and F bar would basically be the Peterson uh, inner product of uh, the automorphic form. Yes. And on the right hand side, it would be, I mean, the L function basically constructed as the Dirichlet series out of the Fourier coefficients of the automorphic form. Right. And, uh, uh, but, but, but not the standard L function, the adjoint L function. So you have to play with these coefficients. 
I see. Okay. So it's not. It's so it's not going to be the Dirichlet series that you just mentioned. I think is. Let me let me show you the next example which you may identify. I take a, an automorphic form on PGL two, which is uh, you can think of as a classical modular form, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm integrating it over the torus. This is the Hecke period. Right. <laughs> and uh, it, it spits out precisely the it, it, so it's the it's basically the Mellin transform of the of the modular form. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it spits out exactly this Dirichlet series that we were talking about. Yes. Okay, and but it's a modular form of uh, well, in the classical case of uh, weight two. Yeah. So you have to you have to play with it to translate it to a homomorphic form with trivial central character. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the weight will not matter, uh, but you just have to multiply by a power of the determinant so that the central character is trivial. Understand. Okay. And just a point about the previous thing. Um, so in the classical case, there is the gross Zagier formula, which is somehow, well, the, the uh, scalar product or this uh, Pearson inner product of the modular form ends up being related to uh, the derivative of the L function at a special value. Yeah, so with other things as well, that there's a height of the uh, Higner point involved in that. Is that, I mean, is this example in that spirit or? Uh, so the, the gross Zagier formula is the arithmetic and first derivative version of the very next example, which I, which is due to Valch uh, Okay. which, which okay, says I, that. So I have to apologize. I didn't see all this list of examples. I wouldn't. No, 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 no. I'm showing it uh, slowly just to keep the oh, suspense. Sorry. So uh, there is this uh, famous example of Alcruzet where instead of taking instead of taking the split torus, you take a non-split torus that splits over a quadratic extension. The letter eta here is the quadratic character associated to the by classical theory to the extension where the torus splits. Mm -hmm. And then if you take the square of the period over the torus then you obtain this L function. This is the standard L function times itself twisted by eta. Okay. And, uh, and it, uh, somehow the, the arithmetic and first derivative version of this formula is the gross Zagier formula. I see. Okay, but uh, for now I'm not gonna, I'm definitely not gonna go in this direction. I'm nice. just talking about values of periods. In the arithmetic setting, you can interpret one side. Once you take derivatives, one side can be interpreted as a height pairing. But, uh -huh. but in the classical, but even the, the formula that I've written here, the left hand side, when you think of classical modular forms, what is this integral? This integral is uh, a sum of values of, the, uh, of, of your modular form over CM points. Right. Yeah, that, okay. Okay, so by the way, this example shows that uh, in general, uh, we do not expect the period itself to be equal to an L function. Sometimes it happens, but more often it's the square of the period that you can express in terms of an L function. Another example is gross Prasad. This is conjectural. And it's a sum of values of uh, Higner points over the quadratic extension defined by um, eta. Right. Uh, the next example which generalizes the formula of Arthuse is the example of gross Prasad. It's uh, the conjecture is that if you integrate, um, is the Ichino Ikeda conjecture, if you integrate a cast form on a product of two groups, SON times SON plus one, over the diagonal of SON, that's the subgroup H that you see here, the square of this period again is attached to an L function. Uh, the group is a product of two groups here. and you take the tensor product representation of the the tensor product of the standard representations of the dual group. The next example that is very well known is the example of state, except that in this case, uh, the space is not homogeneous. The space is just the affine line acted upon by the multiplicative group. So the group is GM. And uh, the way that this example works is you take a Schwartz function on the affine line, on the adels of the affine line. And uh, 
let's fix the Schwarz function. Since we're doing everything unramified, you could take just the characteristic function of the integers, of the integral adults. Just take the characteristic function of the integral adults. Uh, your group is GM, so the automorphic form here is just an automorphic character. And you just integrate the automorphic character against the theta series of this L function. What is the theta series? I've written it down here. Your space is a line. Your function is, your function is a function on the line and you just it, sum it up over its, um, over the rational points of the adelic line in order to make it automorphic. And then you integrate it against the character and this gives you the standard L function, like the Dirichlet L function uh, for the character. And the last example, which is not quite a space. So up to this point, up to this point, we always had if you look at these examples up to this point, we always had a space. Now the last example is not quite a space, um, but it is um, a representation, a representation which quantizes a symplectic space. So it's the veil representation. Omega Psi denotes the veil representation. And you restri I restrict this veil representation to a dual pair how dual pair uh, of commuting subgroups uh, SO2n and SP2n. Now the dual group of these is uh, SO2n times SO2n plus one, but the dual group of this representation restricted to this dual pair is smaller, it's just the diagonal copy of SO2n inside of the dual group of those, which means that I must take my automorphic form to be of the form some automorphic form on SO2n times some theta lift of it to SO to SP2n. And then I choose a Schwarz function again on the space of the veil representation. So this is the space of the veil representation. It's Schrodinger model. It's a Schwarz function in a, on a Lagrangian. And I integrate it I, I integrate its theta series against uh, this product of automorphic forms. And the square of this integral is basically the Rallis inner product formula. It's again uh, related to some uh, L function. So all you see here is a bunch of integrals on the automorphic side. There's no mention of Langlands parameter, but then these integrals spit out an L function. So you can unify you can find a unified formalism for these integrals and it goes like this. Oh, excuse me, Yanis? Yes. In the theta case, what do you integrate over? Uh, again, I integrate over uh, my group. So my group is, this is the group. This is the group. And I'm, yeah, ah, I'm integrating, it's like, it's like in Tate's thesis, I'm integrating over the group. Okay, I see, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and actually you can formulate uh, every example like that. So instead of taking this uh, period integral, which is like a delta function on a period integral is like a delta function on, <coughs> on g mod h, instead of taking a delta function on g mod h, you can take a Schwarz function on g mod h. For example, uh, the characteristic function of the integral points on your on your space, and consider its theta series, which is some automorphic function, and then take its inner product against some automorphic form. And that will spit out a number. And the question is, is this number equal to some L function for the representation uh, where the automorphic form lives? That's the question. In other words, we have a description of L functions purely on the spectral side. We have certain integrals on the automorphic side uh, can we relate one side and the other? So the way we view this list of examples here is in every case, omega, uh, this space of Schwarz functions on the spherical variety, on the variety uh, is the quantization of a Hamiltonian Uh, G space 
which in all cases is just, in all cases in this example, in this table is just cotangent space of X, except in the last case, uh, it's some symplectic vector space. Uh, sorry, could I just ask one other question? Sure. Uh, at the beginning, you formulated it in a situation where you had a global Langlands parameter, right? Yes. But for your question seems to make sense if we only have local Langlands parameters, right? Yeah, so the L function can be defined purely with local Langlands parameters. So right. you don't need global Langlands parameters to, to define it. Okay, so I can think about that situation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll keep, I'll, does anyone have any more questions on this table? Because I'll stop sharing it for, for a while. Uh, just a uh, question on trying to understand, I mean, thinking about these uh, automorphic forms as quantizations of uh, Hamiltonian G-spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, in the quantization picture, these, uh, uh, well, these L values end up being uh, um, eigenstates. Uh, levels? Yeah, so... Um, um, Yes, well, the eigenstates, I would say, what are the eigenstates? I think the eigenstates are the automorphic forms. Right, and their energy levels are these uh, norms of, uh, I mean, these uh, integrals. Uh, perhaps, I cannot confirm that. Uh, just, I don't know exactly what this means. Oh, sorry, uh, just, for, just a quick but, comment. But, but let me just uh, say that our, for us, the basic object here uh, is this um, is this uh, automorphic function or distribution that comes from our quantization omega. Uh, its integral against f is just the spectral decomposition of this of this guy. So this is the this is like the period distribution. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian. This is the period distribution that uh, we're going to study uh, from now on. Minyong, did you have a comment? Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to say that the L function seems like it's going to be an inner product always, is that right? Yeah, the L function will be the inner product of a period distribution with a given automorphic form. So if you want to spectrally, spectrally decompose the period distri distribution, you would write it in terms of these inner products. No, okay. And that's what happens on the spectral side, uh, where for every Langlands parameter, you see an L function. Thanks. Okay. So are, let are, me stop sharing this uh, slide if there are no more questions. Are these definitions of the L functions basically? Or are they Sorry? like. So these things that you've written down, are these basically like the definitions of the L functions? Or are they like theorems that you prove? What? Yeah, so the L function is defined purely on the spectral side. So at this moment, this relation between the period distribution and the L function is completely mysterious. So my goal is to explain how to, how, what is the passage from the period distribution to the L function. These formulas are known or conjectured in the case of gross Prasad. Uh, I would like to explain why what is the nature of these conjectures that relate the period on the automorphic side with the L function, with, which is a priori something on the spectral side. For example, at this point, there's no clear relationship between the space X that I start with or the Hamiltonian manifold T star X or M. There's a priori no relationship between this space X or M and the the representation row of the dual group that appears in the L function. So my goal is to explain uh, a little bit about this relation. Sorry, I think someone asked this question last week maybe, but I, I thought one of the goals of Langlands was to identify, like you have an automorphic representation, you say there's a Galois representation that matches that, and to say one of the signatures that they match is that their L functions agree. This must mean that there's an a priori definition of an L function of an automorphic representation, or is, is, was that just like a myth, that, like a childhood fairy tale or something? Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. There is an a priori uh, definition uh, because, uh, like Mignon said, it all depends on uh, the local Langlands parameter. So if you do everything at the unramified level, the local Langlands parameter is just the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators. Once you know the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators, you can define uh, the L function, but you define it precisely because you know the Langlands parameter. So you, def you define it on the spectral side. Uh, okay, but I mean, if you know that like Frobenius is Hecke locally or something, this is not like some kind of major revelation. That that's all that you need to know in order to define it. On the other hand, this definition in practice is not very useful because it doesn't, it's just an ad, ad hoc definition as an Euler product. If you're not in the function field case where you have this interpretation in terms of cohomology, um, you can't make anything out of this definition. So you need some uh, way to prove, for example, the functional equation or the, uh, something like that. And but, all but of that. So, so, but for that list of examples that you were just showing, if you take as the definition of an L function, this thing defined in terms of HECA operators or equivalently for Benius operators using local Langlands, are that list of stuff that you wrote down, are those like difficult theorems or are those basically just like observations or what? Well, it, the answer goes case, case by case. Some cases are very easy, like the case of Hecke, the Mellin transform. And some cases are very hard, like Varsprouze or the gross Prasad case, which is not known yet. So fortunately, in the last uh, like 10, 15 years, we have developed at least a uniform set of conjectures. But uh, the way to prove these conjectures uh, depends very much case by case. Uh, yeah. May I also, uh, I mean, another, so you're looking at uh, the special values of these L functions, which correspond to uh, periods, I mean, to one specific value, but there are uh, these uh, Billinson theorems, which look at, uh, let's say, the special value of L function of an elliptic curve at two, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not at one precisely, so at other values, and they, I mean, the conjectures are that, they, well, they're related to determinants of regulators of the curve and blah, 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 but is there uh, an analog of uh, those conjectures in the spectral side? So L functions of these uh, G-check uh, representations um, evaluated not at one, but at other points. Uh, there, there's definitely no more, gen I mean, there's no more general form of Bellison conjectures that we can formulate, definitely not, if that's what you're asking. Yes. But I have to say that even for Bellinson, the Lin conjectures, uh, the many cases where we know and have proofs of special values formulas for L functions, mm -hmm. it is because we can realize them as integrals on the automorphic side. And these Absolutely. integrals yes. often have an arithmetic interpretation. They could be, uh, they could be, Related to rights of points and uh, things like that. I mean, yeah, also. like like you saw with the CM points, for example, mm -hmm. they, they, they yeah. could have something to do with Shimura sub varieties and some Shimura varieties. So that's how right. we get our hands on on special values of L function precisely by considering them as periods or some closed geometric analog of periods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, so, and yes, can I ask one more question? Sure. So could you just say one more sentence? So in this waltz per j setting, you indicated there's some derivative version that gives you gross Sagier. Can you just say something about derivatives of L functions and their values here? Just what, how does... Yes, I can say, I can say two words. Mm -hmm. Way junk. <laughs> <laughs> so he has, in his work, he has given a very rigorous and deep interpretation of these things in terms of the derivative version of the relative trace formula. So let me not get into that now. Um, but, but really that's the place to look at. Well, uh, well can, I, can I, I mean like you expect special values of derivatives of L functions to fall into this framework when exactly? Well, Look, I mean, in the function field setting, there's the work of uh, Wei Zhang and uh, Zhiwei, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
where they have a very general interpretation of all derivatives, for example, uh, in the setting where, um, in the gross Prasad setting. Yes. Right, so, um, I, I, maybe I'm not the person to ask for how far this can go, but definitely this is a very fruitful uh, direction. Well, or can you say in what sense is the derivative version of the waltz J formula, the gross Sergei formula? Can, can I skip this? Because this is, uh, this is an entirely different, uh, like it's, a, it's orthogonal to where I want to go. Okay. Uh, sure. Maybe we can okay, discuss so, it afterwards, but I would have to introduce the relative trace formula and all of these things <laughs> that I don't want to do today. Wei, Wei Zhang's ICM address does a very good good job of explaining this and maybe just to say the word that there's legs of Stukas. You need to introduce legs for derivatives. So that's sort of the a slogan. I, but maybe maybe let's yeah. I, I yeah. mean I'm I'm aware of that, but it, I don't see so how, let how me, let me, what's being discussed right here. I mean I, I yeah. know the flavor of the formula, but here there's something that says an L value is like one inter period integral is equal to some L function value. Yeah. So so let's leave this aside for for, for now. Uh, because it's a little bit orthogonal to, uh, it's completely orthogonal to <laughs> uh, where I was going to. So let me uh, pick it up from uh, where I was in the previous slide. So we said that we have some uh, uh, Hamiltonian space, Hamiltonian G space uh, M. Uh, so Hamiltonian means that it also has a moment map. So for example, uh, T star X for some space X, and we have some uh, quantization um, omega uh, uh, for example, uh, this Schwarz space of uh, adelic points of X. So this is this is for now a local quantization, but we also have some automorphic uh quantization or automorphic functional uh that takes me from omega to functions on the automorphic space on band g let's say so for example if you take a, a vector phi in the schwarz space here this is gonna go to the theta series of phi that i wrote like this okay so this is by definition is the sum over x of k of phi of gamma times your argument. And uh, this is the guy that we want to uh, interpret. Um, and uh, what I said is let's fix phi. So if, if x is small, uh, let's take phi to be just the characteristic function of the integers of x and in this case um, in this case uh, this uh, theta series sigma phi which is our period uh, distribution uh, has a geometric interpretation as follows uh, it's well geometric interpretation means that it is it corresponds through the shift function dictionary to something uh, geometric uh, what is this geometric thing well you're gonna take uh, bungee which you can think of as maps uh, from the curve to the classifying space of g and over it you're gonna have the space of sections uh, let's call it ban x, which is going to be the space of sections of uh, x. So this classifies G bundles together with a section of the corresponding twist of, of x. And if we call this map P, then uh, phi, well, the, this function on ban G uh, is, through the function shift uh, dictionary, the push forward of the 
it's counting the number of, of lifts. So it's the push forward of the, of the constant shift, uh, of the constant shift on, uh, on band G, on band X, uh, or in order to, uh, in order to also accommodate the non-smooth case. So in the non-smooth case, you would not want to work with a constant function. You would want to work with, so to speak, the IC function of uh, the arc space of X. So um, instead of pushing forward the constant shift, let's push forward the IC of ban X. So this is our period distribution. And now you should compare it with what you saw in the previous slide. Let me remind you on the spectral side, uh, we had uh, the stack of local systems, which is something like for G check, which is something like uh, maps from the Deram version of the curve to uh, the classifying space here. And above it, uh, well, we had fixed the representation of the uh, we had fixed the representation of the dual group. So above it, we had the uh, space of fixed vectors in the dual representation, uh, which was maps uh, from the Deram version of the curve to the mod G check on, on the spectral side. And here we considered the push forward of um, the push forward of the structure shift of, uh, of this space. So this belongs in some appropriate derived, whatever triangulated category of quasi coherent shifts on local systems. And like I said, I will ignore Arthur parameters and INCOH and all of that. And here on this side, this belongs to the, let me use the, so th this belongs to something like D modules on uh, band G, or if you want uh, derived, derived category of constructible sheets. So it is natural to conjecture uh, that uh, these two objects are dual under the geometric Langlands uh, correspondence which brings these two space, spaces, roughly speaking, in duality. So under geometric Langlands, not in duality, in an equivalence between those two. So under geometric Langlands, uh, this is dual, it corresponds to, to this. Sorry, Yannis. Um... What's the yes. relation between X and V? Yes, this is what I haven't gotten to yet. So uh -huh. how, how much time do I have? Do I have some time to talk about like 10 minutes? 10 minutes is fine. Yeah, yeah. okay. So let me talk about the relation between, between the two. So let me just say that this, is, uh, this conjecture is slightly imprecise, uh, but it's good enough, I think. And it's, it's, it's part of the machinery that David talked about, that given given a, um, like given this Hamiltonian space M, there is a dual space M check that I haven't talked about and I will talk about now, which is related to this space V. And uh, there's a duality between them and the whole machinery of all the hierarchy of Langlands, geometric Langlands conjectures spits out conjectures uh, of this form that something is some something on one side corresponds to some some other object on, on the other side. So you can discuss this correspondence in the local case, you can discuss it in the global case. It spits out some conjectures that uh, over number fields recover uh, conjectures that we already had. So let me explain now what is the dual Hamiltonian space. Uh, the dual Hamiltonian space typically has the form, it's not the space V that you saw here, but it is, uh, so V is really, in reality, V is not a representation of, um, 
of, of the group G check, but of the dual group attached to the spherical variety, to, to the variety X. Uh, so the dual group attached to the variety X, like we said, so if M is T star X, uh, you, the, the gate scoring Nadler dual group is a subgroup of the check that tells you which Langlands parameters uh, are allowed to appear uh, in the spectral decomposition of the periods uh, coming from X. So the Hamiltonians, so you have this dual group and you also have this uh, representation row of the dual group and the Hamiltonian space is uh, induced uh, from that. So it's the contracted product uh, of those two, although um, a priori it's not clear at all why they should be Hamiltonian and all of that, but uh, there are reasons. To, well, actually, part of the story is that, yeah, so part of the conjecture also supplies some reasons why this should be Hamiltonian. Let me go back to the previous screen, to the previous um, table, and let's see what is the uh, let's see what is the uh, let's see what is the dual uh, space. Oops, it doesn't seem like I can erase very efficiently. Uh, okay, so let me. Actually, okay, so I cannot erase very efficiently, so let me just not waste the time. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, uh, so here. In this first example, the Whittaker example, uh, the dual group is the entire dual group. So basically, uh, but there's no representation. The representation is trivial. So basically what I should write in this case is I should write that the dual, the dual Hamiltonian space is just a point contracted product over G check with G check. In other words, uh, it's a point. It's G check mod G check. That's the dual of the Whittaker space. Uh, let me jump to the third example. Uh, the dual of the Whittaker period uh, is going to be, so it's going to be induced. I'm gonna take T mod W and I'm going to induce it from the trivial group up to G check. Well, this can be understood. Uh, this here can be understood as the constant section. And the whole space can be understood as the uh, cotangent, uh, the, the, the twist, the cotangent space of the Whittaker model. So the twisted, the twisted cotangent bundle of G mod n. So now you see the duality. You started with the trivial space and you obtain the Whittaker model, or you started with the Whittaker model and you obtain the trivial space. In the group case, the dual uh, is just the adjoint or adjoint or co-adjoint representation. You can put a star here. So actually, the dual space in this case is just um, h star h star check uh, over h check with h check squared. This is just the cotangent space. Of H. So you see the Hamiltonian dual of the cotangent bundle of H is the cotangent bundle of its dual. And if you go down this list, you're going to see uh, you're going to see this list of dualities here. For example, 
uh, the gross Prasad period is dual to the theta correspondence. So you have this miraculous duality. So in the last five minutes uh, or three minutes, uh, uh, the last thing I will say is how do you actually compute what is the dual coming out of a space X? So if you know the space X, how do you actually compute the dual? Um, So how to, how to compute the dual if you have the space X? Given, I'm only going to talk about the cotangent space, so given M equals T star X, how to compute uh, the M, M dual, but M dual is going to be induced from uh, the dual group of X, and we know how to compute the dual group of X, uh, I'm not going to say too much about this. So basically, I'm going to tell you how to compute this representation. Uh, for reasons that I don't have time to explain, this boils down to, to the local Plancherel formula uh, for uh, L2 of uh, uh, X of F, F is a local field, uh, maybe GO invariant vectors, basically it boils down to the spectral decomposition. You have this function phi, which is, so to speak, the IC function of the arc space of, uh, of X. So this is a function which is supported on the integers of x and the question is uh, what is the spectral decomposition of this so when you write down the plancherel formula for this function you want to see something like uh, an integral over uh, Langlands para unramified Langlands parameters, not for the group G, but for this smaller group GX check. So this is going to be something like the maximal torus of GX check modulo the Weyl group of GX check. Then you're going to have here the standard, uh, you know, invariant measure of the Weyl integration formula for GX check. Uh, so this is the standard uh, Weyl determinant, if you want. And uh, the beef will come here. The beef is going to be this L function that is associated to this Satake parameter or to this Langlands parameter. So this is what you want to compute. And it may sound very analytic to you, but it also has uh, geometric and uh, there is a geometric formulation. And this calculation has been done, uh, this calculation has been done in, uh, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, this calculation has been done, uh, so L phi rho has been computed in a number of cases. Uh, sorry, uh, what is rho? Uh, again, rho is the, it stands for, so rho is the representation of the dual group, some graded representation of the dual group. So this is what we actually want to com compute. That's right. So I thought that you were telling us how to get that rather than... Yeah, so this is what we actually want to compute. And I'm saying that the way to, to get that is through the local Plancherel formula or wow. through some uh, more geometric version of that. Uh, so uh, the, the calculation is still not very enlightening, but uh, at least 
uh, we have ways to do it in every single case. So uh, when um, when X is uh, a homogeneous space uh, affine, so uh, H is reductive, uh, this calculation was done by in a previous paper of mine uh, called spherical functions on spherical varieties uh, and I'll tell you in a more just very briefly what is the basic input here and that's all that matters uh, when x is not necessarily alpha uh, homogeneous but it is uh, some uh, L embedding of a group. So these are, uh, suppose that you have a reductive group with a determinant map with some character and a lift of this character, then um, this co-character uh, corresponds to, uh, this co-character for the group becomes the highest weight for the dual group. So it corresponds to a representation V lambda of the dual group. And it also defines a certain uh, embedding of the group called the L monoid. So for example, think here of the Godemar Jacquet case where H is GLN and uh, H lambda for appropriate lambda is the space of N by N matrices. And then uh, this V lambda was computed in this case, in, in my work with uh, uh, Boutier and Go, And not surprisingly, it's related, I mean, the row here is related to this V lambda, not surprisingly. And the latest development, which is a vast generalization, uh, of these things is in my, work that we're finishing up with uh, Jonathan Wang. And actually, I deserve very little credit for this. It just, it is a tour de force by Jonathan, where he considers, we consider X to be uh, arbitrary, an arbitrary uh, affine uh, spherical variety. Um, for now, we restrict to the case where the dual group is uh, the whole dual group. So, strictly speaking, it doesn't include the previous case, for example. But I think the methods uh, will include that. And again, uh, we have a decomposition of the uh, of the IC function of the. We have a spectral decomposition of the IC function of X of O. Um, in terms of a certain L function uh, for, uh, for um, uh, for unramified Langlands parameters. And uh, what is the basic input in these formulas? Basic input to compute, uh, to compute this representation of the dual group, uh, it is it is the following. So I'm going to give you a combinatorial description. I don't have a very good description otherwise. So I, I'm I'm taking the maximal torus of the dual group, and I will tell you where to find the weights, uh, the, the weights uh, v sub chi. Uh, for this representation. So what are, what is uh, V sub chi, V sub x, what are, what are the, there are various weights here. And uh, the answer depends on the geometry of x. So let me restrict to the case where x is the minimal affine closure of a homogeneous space. So h here is not necessarily reductive. Then, uh, you know, I said spherical variety. Spherical means that um, it has an open Borel orbit. So this is the open Borel op orbit. And the complement of the open Borel orbit is a bunch of divisors 
uh, uh, which are called B-stable divisors, uh, D, which are called colors. Uh, these colors uh, you should think of as some kind of uh, mm, if I had time, which I'm terribly over time, so I'm not gonna say anything about this, but these colors are basically describe the geometry of the Hamiltonian space. Um, oops, I made the mistake and I added the page before. Okay, so these colors uh, divide, the, define the, the, describe the geometry of the Hamiltonian space M equals T star X. And each of these colors, each uh, D, uh, gives a valuation uh, V sub D, which I want to restrict on the uh, on the restrict to the Borel eigenfunctions um, uh, on these varieties. So uh, this gives uh, this actually now becomes a co-character. Uh, it becomes a weight for the dual torus. And just as a single example, and I'm finishing here, uh, let's consider the group case that everyone is familiar with. Uh, then uh, what are the colors? The colors are the Bruja divisors. And if you see what valuation the Bruja divisors, the, so the co-dimension one, Bruja cells, what are the valuations that they induce on the function field and in particular on the, on the um, Borel eigenfunctions? Uh, these valuations uh, are equal to uh, simple chords. And out of this information, you can compute that uh, the dual representation uh, is the adjoint representation is the representation where you where you see these uh, simple roots or the co-adjoint representation you see these simple core roots appearing which are now weights for the dual group yeah sorry i went terribly over time so let me stop here thank you oh, sorry I'll, I'll just get in two quick questions and then let others speak but just to make sure about the elementary part, I think what you're saying is that 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 integral formula for the IC function square determines the row, right? Uh, yes, I'm saying that the integral that the Plancharel formula for uh, mm -hmm. for this function uh, determines the row. Uh, right. the, the, the L right. function appears in the Plancharel formula. Maybe right. maybe I'll just say that you know. When I write something like this, mm. it also has a geometric interpretation. It is the trace of Frobenius on um, uh, it's it's a trace of Frobenius on um, uh, on um, endomorphisms derived endomorphisms of uh, IC. Uh -huh, I see. Uh, and that's how uh, once so. Another part of our conjecture is the local and ramified conjecture generalizing the work of, the work of uh, Bezrukovnikov and Finkelberg, right. uh, which tells you uh, how to express this uh, on the dual side. I see. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. The, the conjecture is that, uh, so to speak, D modules on x of f mod g of o is the same as uh, uh, the category of uh, quasi coherence well depends what you mean by deep modules but let's say perfect well uh, perfect complexes on the dual hamiltonian space uh, mod uh, the dual group mm, okay so this allows you to compute once, if you know this conjecture, which actually besides Bezukafikov and Finkelberg, there's also recent work of Braverman and Finkelberg for other cases. Uh, so if you can prove this conjecture, this implies that the L2 norm of the IC function can be written as 
an integral of L functions attached to M check. I see. Yeah. So to just ask one more uh, uh, direction question in a different direction, when you go from X to psi X, the distribution, you're viewing that psi X is lying inside the quantization of M, I guess. Is that right? Sorry, so what was psi X? You mean the... Psi was the distribution. Or phi, yeah, sorry, it was phi, not psi. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, so we view this as living in the quantization and in the unramified story that I talked about, it is a distinguished element of the quantization. Right, so this, this procedure of going from X to the distribution, uh, I guess in L function theory or in automorphic theory, it's very natural. Do you have a TQFT interpretation of this? Uh, yeah, so I think this is the story of uh, uh, boundary conditions that right, David right. talked about. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is going to be, so this, this, uh, okay, so th there's the local and the global story. Right. So the global story uh, would um, attach this, uh, precisely this um, D module to the, to the given curve. Right. So the boundary condition would attach this uh, D module to the given curve. The local story is that uh, you would just consider uh, the quantization as a G of F category. So you can consider uh, sheaves or D modules on X of F uh, as, a, as a G of F category. Mm. So this X or maybe this M, which is T star X, uh, will give you some, um, it's what David con calls a boundary condition with which in every setting that you are will spit out some object in your, in your uh, field theory. Yeah, I see, no, I, I, I think I understand. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I've been dominating the, the conversation, um, but, um, are there any other questions for Yannis? Yeah, may I ask a question? Hi, Yannis. Hi, Vic. Hi. So I have a question. You mentioned that in one case, there was an extension of uh, C star by some H with determinant involved. I remember there was a sh short paper by Bao Chao, I believe in uh, Petetsky Shapira. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's- Does it have something to do with that? Yeah, yeah. So it's the proof of what he conjectured there. Uh, oh, I see. And yeah, does, so... uh, does the Mirabolic case is it covered by that uh, or it's a different case? What do you mean the Mirabolic case? I mean the case where we, what we did with Misha and uh, Kravkin. And, well, uh, we proved much less in that. So let me go to the I'm slide just asking where... whether it's covered by the Bao Chao consideration or it's a different story. No, I, I don't think that anything that you did is covered because our, our calculation is simply for the IC function. It's mm -hmm. not a categorical statement. But is it, I'm just asking, is it a case where some, something is extended and there's a determinant or it's a different case? Mm. Yeah, or is this picture that you have, where, where there is this determinant, is this completely general with l monoid, or it's just an example of some, some example? Uh, sorry, this, this is just some example. I see. Uh, I, but I think what you did, um, if I remember correctly, what you did is a special case of this general framework, but it corresponds to the rankin selberg period. I see. And so this so is it, not in your list. If you, well, it was not in this list, but it is in some, I mean, it's not in the list of, that you see on this page. I see. Uh, but it is on the list of conjectures that we're stating. I see. So if instead of, um, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, where to place this work of yours, uh, if instead of, um, let me just briefly write to answer your question. So uh, before I mentioned the gross Prasad period, uh, which is, uh, sorry, SON diagonal, 
mod SON times SON plus one. And on the dual side, uh, you see, um, so on the dual side, your dual group is, uh, is SO, well, let me take it to be 2N, uh, 2N. It's gonna be SO2N times SP2N. And then the representation will be the tensor product of the standard representations. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you do the same thing, and this is the theta correspondence. Mm -hmm. If you do the same thing with the ranking selberg period, so GLN cross GLN plus one mod GLN, mm -hmm. then on the dual side, you're gonna get again this, And you're going to have uh, rho equals uh, standard tensor. Uh, I should put some dualities here, and I don't remember where to put them. Mm -hmm. But it's basically this times its dual, or maybe maybe I should put the dual, mix the duals, something like that. And if I remember correctly from discussing with Misha, this is uh, this is. A space you have considered. Yes. That, that's yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there some other questions? Uh, just a small question. This uh, module that you get on Bungie, the P lower star of uh, IC, is this uh, is this eigen with respect to the geometric uh, Hecke operators? No, no, no. Completely non eigen, and that's the reason why. Uh, you have spectral decomposition of it, and you can pair it with uh, many cast, many automorphic representations, and each of them will give you an L function. So, uh, to to see how non eigen it is, you sh should think of this uh, dual group GX check. Mm -hmm. So, pretty much every Langlands parameter into GX check uh, will be represented here in this shift. So. so Okay. If it was if it was eigen, then its integral against a, an automorphic form would usually be zero, okay. unless the automorphic form was in the same or in the dual eigen space, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. So here I'm saying that unless, of course, you start with a trivial case g mod g, so then you get the constant function. Mm -hmm. In general, it's completely non-eigen. Interesting. Okay. Any other questions? And that's also expressed in the the formula for the duality that the dual is not a skyscraper on local systems, but is sort of supported on some big locus of local right. systems coming from this G checks of X or something like that. Right. Sorry, I'm still trying to understand how things fit together. Is it? Are you saying that if you have two dual objects under geometric Langlands, that there are L functions associated to both, and that they should agree? Uh... Actually, you don't need to scroll at all. That, that's exactly what I'm looking at. For example, on the right-hand side, whenever you have any sheaf, like in this case, it's P star, of like this very nice guy. But in general, if you have any sheaf, then you get an L function by saying, uh, like at some point, which corresponds to a local system, I'll look at the trace of Frobenius acting on the vector space at that point. So in this, in this uh, slide, this is, uh, this is so-called the period integral. And, uh, and and this here is the this here is the L function. Now, uh, when do you expect this to actually be an L function? So you might you might you might conjecture that uh, this Hamiltonian duality between M and M check is completely general. But when do you expect your M check to have the form of an L function? The answer is you should expect this when M is uh, what is called a, ha a multiplicity free Hamiltonian manifold. When you have this multiplicity free condition, then M check uh, should essentially correspond to an L function. What does multiplicity free mean? Multiplicity free, so for example, uh, if M is a cotangent space, uh, then uh, it is a multiplicity free Hamiltonian manifold uh, if X is spherical. 
has an open borel orbit. That's, that's the condition for being multiplicity free in the cotangent case. What does multiplicity free mean? Uh, the algebraic definition you can give is consider the, consider the, uh, the moment map, then multiplicity free means that uh, a general co-adjoint orbit uh, has finitely many uh, G orbits over it. That's the definition of uh, multiplicity free Hamiltonian manifold. This uh, finite multiplicity uh, condition morally tells you that when you spectrally decompose this, you're going to get Euler products. That's, that's a philosophy here. Now, you might hope to do this bijection also for more general spaces. And something that I had mentioned in a comment last week is that you can play this game with spaces, uh, toric varieties, but more generally spaces which have an action of the torus. And then you will see that the multiplicity free condition on one side seems to correspond to the smooth smooth affine condition on the other side. So this duality takes smoothness to multiplicity freeness. Okay. At least that's what we have observed up to this point. Okay, nice. Um, I, so, uh, uh, sorry, um, I guess um, uh, this, this session is open uh, until 10 o'clock, so people are free to keep chatting but maybe for the majority for uh, for the session uh, the official session so to speak it's uh, we should thank Yanis again for a beautiful talk thank, thank you, you. Very much. and next week Arnav is going to speak actually uh let me just pull up his title Arnav is going to talk about non-algebraic attractor points and higher dimensional Calabial manifolds I'll send out an announcement as well so Okay, so um, thank you again. And as I said, people can keep talking. Thank you, Jan. That was really nice. Thanks. Thanks for your questions. So I'd at least be interested in discussing further, like the arithmetic stuff. Like, there's, uh -huh. a, there's a there's an obstruction, just the kind of naive numerical obstruction that almost none of these there are no no more examples except the gone gross prasad type examples and the problem is like what you're trying to formulate is that uh you would instead of the automorphic space you would take like a shimmer variety or something something some kind of algebraic variety for g and then you want the one for h to be like half dimensional so you can formulate some kind of pairing and just in, in not pretty much none of the examples except for gone gross prasad is that the case? So, uh, if I remember correctly, um, the, the, this half-dimensional condition uh, is reflected in the grading on the dual side, or the point of evaluation of the L function. So, um, and the, let me go to the table. No, that's the wrong one, sorry. So you see the L functions here are evaluated at various different points. And uh, only, I think it's exactly the cases uh, when they're evaluated at a half where uh, the Shimura variety of H is half dimensional in the Shimura variety of G, if I, if I remember correctly. And uh, those tend to be also the cases where the dual group is the entire dual group. That's why the, that's why, that's why the case where the dual group is the entire group is probably the most interesting one. In that case, the, the dual in that case the dual Hamiltonian manifold. There's nothing to induce. 
there's nothing to induce. It's already a vector space. In that case, uh, this dual manifold is just already a vector space with a representation of the dual group. So all the examples on this table are Congress without examples. Are, are there any ones that are not? Not all of them. Uh, so, for example, you see the group case is not Gangrel Prasad. No, but both. that uh, that one doesn't work, right? Like that's not one of the uh, half dimensional cases. Uh, the Rankin Selberg case is not Gangrel Prasad, uh, for example. Uh, it's not on this table, but I think, yeah. Uh, you can do Rankin oh, Selberg. Okay. The, the classical Rankin Selberg with Eisenstein series. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, in the case of modular curves, that also has arithmetic interpretation using Ziegel units. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So, the Eisenstein series. So I would regard like GLN, GLN plus one as, as GGP as well. But uh, yeah, so for like triple product, I think is what you're saying. Like, yeah, so there are low there are, rank examples as well. Yeah. yeah. But clearly the geometric conjecture somehow contains the whole L function. Uh, so, in some sense. Yeah, I think your question is also related to Sam's earlier question. So when you want to have arithmetic interpretation, maybe derivatives and intersections, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Uh, I don't have anything smart to say. How do you do that if the dimension is not middle dimension? I don't, I don't know. In this uh, middle dimensional example, I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, so it's half dimensional in a uh, Kähler variety, is there also supposed to be a Lagrangian submanifold or? Uh, which, which one are you referring to? What is this? So I missed some of the, but you guys were talking about where a, the Shimura variety for H is half the dimension uh, of the Shimura variety for G. Mm -hmm. Well, it, first of all, it's it's the arithmetic version, so it's never really like like a Kähler okay. variety. Okay, so it's not over C. Okay, Is there anything like that. And and I guess also one doesn't embed in the other, does it? More or less does. I see. So I had a, so I really like your point of view on uh, the viewing, I mean, exactly on this page that the automorphic uh, picture is somehow, con well, even the classical picture is quantization of Hamiltonian G spaces uh, somehow. And um, so in that uh, um, quantization picture, what a automorphic form means and what their uh, L functions mean. So um, in, well, there is something related to this by uh, Sarnak and that's for this uh, quantum unique ergodicity. I mean, in the simplest case, you start off with the modular curve. Uh, the Hamiltonian that you look at is just uh, the Laplacian. So the eigenfunctions are basically mass forms in that case. Yeah, but... Um, um, but maybe what you are saying is that, for example, uh, the modules on band G are a quantization of the ah the Hitchin integral of the Hitchin, yeah. Right. That's the okay. yeah. Okay. That's uh, why here here we're talking about first of all we're starting with a space that knows nothing about arithmetic. We're talking about we're starting with a variety, nothing. Like our, my space X is not a locally symmetric space. It's it's just some variety. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the input is of this form, non-arithmetic at first. Right. And then we okay. By the way, I, I've heard that the L function could be interpreted as some kind of analytic torsion in some space of characters or Galois representations, or I, I'm not even sure whether this was on wow. the Galois side. Could, could you comment, uh, and I don't even remember this story very well, could, could you comment on that and how it's related to your interpretation possibly? Yeah, we should have Akshay here. He says that the Reidenmeister tors torsion is, is the L function, but I cannot explain this. Uh, but Reidenmeister torsion of what? That does make sense, I mean, a little bit, but uh, of what? Reidenmeister torsion of what exactly? 
I can I, I really I cannot I'm not familiar. I don't. I don't know. Uh, but actually, his previous work on Rademeister torsion can probably provide some hints. Maybe someone knows about it. I think this is explained in nicely in some of Mignon's uh, papers. But I mean, this is you know, there's this uh, Tamagawa covariant Tamagawa number conjectures of of Kato and and um, the um, so I mean the idea that there's some that we're supposed to think of the L function as a ratio of two trivializations of some determinant of cohomology. Mm -hmm. of, a, of a Gaul representation, one of which is kind of a tri uh, an easy one to find, and the other one is sort of equivalent to developing the theory of L function. So somehow the idea is that there should be interesting elements of determinant lines of um, of Galois representations, determinants of cohomology, and uh, you can you can kind of repackage the theory of L functions into the existence of some mysterious elements of these determinant lines. The L function is then a ratio of these with some boring boring um, trivialization of these determinant lines. But um, that's uh, perspective in your current one inform each other at all. I'm sorry. Is that perspective in your current one where you're interpreting the L function in terms of these like push forwards, sheaves? Do those two perspectives inter um, help each other at all? I mean, they're they're somehow it's closely related, I think, but I, I don't. Um, I don't think there's anything intelligent I can say about this. But I mean, there, there's certainly the, um, the relation between partition, right of muscular torsion and partition functions of field theory is, is, is kind of well understood. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and this is supposed to be some arithmetic, arithmetic analog, but. I see. Thanks. 